Welcome to the fourth lecture of Educational Theoretical Perspective series. I'm Dr. Sonia Khan, DPhil in Education from the University of Oxford. For those of you who joined me previously in my lectures, welcome back. And to those who are new, it's great to have you. In this lecture, I will talk about activity theory. I will discuss its growth and development from first generation to second generation. Then in the subsequent lecture, I will talk about third generation activity theory and also briefly discuss the fourth generation, which is in its nascent stage. So let's get started. The model for first generation activity theory is shown in figure one. It draws heavily or traces its history to Vygotsky's concept of mediation, according to which the relation between subject and object is culturally mediated. The key aspect of Vygotsky's concept of mediation, mediated action can be seen in a scenario in which a learner is trying to learn a new concept and is solving tasks related to it in collaboration with a more knowledgeable other, say a teacher. So what happens in this situation? The student's learning is mediated by means of double stimulation. That is by human assistance, which is the teacher, and the tools that this teacher introduces to the learner. So the situation highlights the relation between human action and cultural artifacts. During this phase, the focus was on tool-mediated joint action and not activity. It was Lenative Vygotsky's student who explained this concept of activity, which then became the unit of analysis for second generation of activity theory, as Engelstrom proposed. So before we venture into understanding second generation activity theory, Let's first understand the concept of activity. According to Lenativ, it is the activity that mediates the relationship between subject and object. He says that to investigate in an activity, one requires to first discover its object. What is it that this activity is trying to achieve? What is the motive or need that drives the activity? He provides a distinction between action and activity through the hierarchical structure of activity as shown in figure two. And he provides two examples to explain the structure. The first example he gives is that of primeval hunting. That is when members of a tribe go for hunting. The object of this activity is to obtain food and clothing. So to satisfy this social need of food and clothing, members of the tribe take separate goals or have separate goals and take charge of different actions. For example, some might frighten the herd, others might kill the game, while others might have other tasks to do. And most likely, the motive behind this activity is just to stay alive. So what's Leonard trying to point out here? He's trying to help us understand that to understand how separate human actions are meaningful, one requires to understand the motive behind the whole activity. Another thing which is important to realize or become aware of in this hierarchical structure is that activity is object oriented while actions are goal-oriented. Another example he gives is that of driving a manual car. So through this example, he tries to demonstrate or illustrate the movement from one level of structure of activity to another. The first lesson in learning to drive a manual car is to change gears, is to learn to change gears without starting the engine. So that's the object. Or the goals would be 
to move gears, which is a conscious action. And the underlying operations would be to understand, to, to know the position of gears. Once this activity is mastered, we move to the next object. And that is to change gears while driving the car. In this case, the goal is to change gears based on speed or road conditions. And it, is, it requires a conscious, conscious action. While the underlying operations now start to fade away because you've already mastered the position of gears. And then once you become an accomplished driver, this driving remains no longer an activity. It becomes a part of action of another activity, which could be going on a picnic, driving car to a specific location, or driving uphill. And the operations in this situation become automatic. They completely fade away. So you see both Vygotsky and Lenitiv talk about cultural organization of activities, but their emphasis differs significantly. For Vygotsky, the genesis and mediation of mind is through mediation, cultural mediation. And for Lenitiv, the genesis and mediation of mind is through activity. Now, Lenitiv, though he implies um, the components of division of labor, community, and rules in the activity that takes place, he did not provide any structure for activity system. And that's where second generation of activity system comes in. It provides the generic model of second generation activity theory. So let's try to understand this model by going through the different components. Let's start by activity system. Activity system refers to organizations or institutions that have long history, that have taken shape and are transformed over a lengthy period of time. And it is against their own history that their problems or potentials of change can be understood. The next component is subject. It refers to individuals or subgroups whose position and point of view are chosen as perspectives of analysis of activity. What this means is that people bring their histories from the positions that they take in the division of labor. Next component is object, which refers to problem space or raw material at which the activity is directed. The object turns into outcomes by means of instruments, mediational artifacts. Now there are both general and specific objects. For example, general object would be health of people, while specific object will be illness of a particular patient. Next component here is rules, which refers to implicit and explicit regulations that constrain the human actions in the activity. Then we have community, which is which refers to individuals and subgroups that share the same general object. And lastly is division of labor, which refers to horizontal division of tasks and vertical division of power and status. Now, this entire activity system can be summarized on the basis of five principles, some of which I have already explained when describing the components of the activity system. Let's start with that one by one. So the first principle, if you focus on, let me go back to the previous slide, because here you can see a triangle slightly bigger. Uh, just focus on the first, the top, top, top triangle, two triangles basically. Um, so the first principle involves artifact mediated, collective object oriented activity which becomes the unit, the prime unit of analysis in second generation activity system. Individual goals and underlying operations can be understood against the backdrop of the entire activity system. The next principle is multi-voicedness. Since we are talking of collective activity, that means multiple individuals are involved or different subgroups are involved. So therefore, there will be multiple voices. All right. So voices of community of, with diverse interests, traditions, point of views, uh, 
and also their histories, the different positions that participants take because of division of labor. They carry their own histories and engraved rules and conventions, which can become source of trouble as well as innovation, and therefore might also demand translation and negotiation. Then next principle involves historicity. As I stated earlier, these organizations have long histories, lengthy period of time by means of which they take shape and uh, transform their organizations. So history can be understood or should be read both from local uh, perspective, that is local history of the activity and its object, as well as global history of the use of tools and theoretical ideas in relation to that object or activity. Next is contradictions that refer to structural tensions within and between organizations or activity systems. The primary contradiction in capitalism, according to Marx, is between use value and exchange value of commodities. Secondary contradiction can arise because of collision of old and new elements. For example, some technology is introduced. It might create tensions in relation to division of labor and rules. And these tensions can also be then led to huge disturbances or troubles, but these can also be source of innovations. And that's where the fifth principle comes in, expansive learning. How to bring these people together and bring change in the organization. So it refers to long cycles of qualitative transformations. When contradictions aggravate, sometimes the individual participants begin to question the sense of activity and start to deviate from the established norms. Bateson, from whom this idea has been derived, states that in psychiatry, such people are called psychotic. And that's where this expansive learning is, is a wonderful idea because it does not let these people isolate, rather uses the aggravated disturbances or sense of deviation to make meaningful changes in the organizations through dialogue. So to conclude, growth from first generation to second generation highlighted a shift from human consciousness to object-oriented collective activity. And thereby, you see, the unit of analysis and object and problem have also changed. I end this lecture with the slide for you to go through. I've already explained these terms in my lecture. If you've liked this lecture, please subscribe my channel, spread the word, share these videos or links with people who you think might benefit from these lectures. Press the bell icon and please don't forget to send in your questions or comments. I really wait for them. Thank you.